All right, we're gonna go straight into our next panel. And I wanna give you guys our moderator for this next panel. Let me introduce to you Dr. Karen Dade, the moderator of our next panel. Ms. Dade is currently a professor emerita at Western Washington University. And actually, I just wanna make sure, because I, well, I don't have my phone, so unfortunately, I, I was supposed to do an updated version, but this is, <laughs> didn't get changed in time. All right, and she is also the CEO and founder of the Multicultural International Development Company. So I just want to uh, introduce to you Karen Dade, all right? Please come up. Give her a round of applause. TJ, wow. I met TJ when he was in the 10th grade, and he was a mover and shaker back then, and he still is now. So, all right, thank now you, TJ, for the introduction. <laughs> okay, I guess this is for me. Our panelists are taking their seats. How's everybody doing? Why don't you just, if you need to stand up and stretch your legs, please do that while I kind of get coordinated here. Just stretch. Wow, my heart is full just from the, the beauty of the conference and all of the previous speakers. Um, just eye-opening. And I just really want to thank you and all of those who helped to make this conference uh, possible. Well, friends, I tell you. Life ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I've been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on those steps. Cause you find it's kinda hard. Don't you fall now. For eyes still going, honey. Eyes still climbing, and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Who's the author of that poem? Yes, 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 Langston Hughes. I too sing. Yes. So we're talking today about in living color, reconstructing the canon. Now, Wiki defines the canon as a body of high culture, literature, music, philosophy, and works of art that are highly valued in the West. Works that have achieved the status of classics. I say to you the poem that I just read is a classic. Would you agree? Yes. I want to just introduce you to all of the uh, wonderful panelists up here, and then I'll start with our, our first speaker. In the order of speaking will be Melina Hill Walker, as a program director at the Endowment for Health, focuses on projects to advance health, equity, in New Hampshire. Denise Kaur, Denise, just raise your hand, is a media historian working on early cinema history, film preservation, and Asian American film and media culture. Allison Rollins is a 2023-24 Harvard Radcliffe Institute Fellow and was named a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellow in 2019. She's Assistant Professor in English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And O'Marthen Clark is the Assistant Director for Diversity, Inclusion, and Equal Opportunity 
at Worcester State University and the instructor of art education at Ohio State University. You know, so many of our stories using the arts have been co-opted and whitewashed and or shut out and non-acceptable as true art. Millennia, whose title today is from a monochromatic to vibrant theater as an expression of people's culture, heritage, and history. Monochromatic means the use of only one color. How can we move that to being vibrant, to being multiple waves of light? Melina will present briefly on her father, Dr. Errol Gaston Hill, seminal works of regarding the history of Caribbean and African American theater, highlighting specifically his award-winning history of black Shakespearean actors, Shakespeare and Sable. Melina. Uh, thank you, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, through my brief presentation entitled Monochromatic to Vibrant, Theater as an Expression of a People's Culture, Heritage, and History, I will share some of my father's, Errol Gaston Hill's, life and scholarship. Monochromatic to vibrant, as Karen said, uh, in my title signifies a transition from a simple black-white dichotomy to the richness in colors and character of the African diaspora, inclusive of the African African-American and Caribbean cultures, heritage, and history. Okay, um, so slide number two. As most of us here today recognize, the first three words of this year's Black New England Conference title, I Too Sing, stems from esteemed poet Langston Hughes's 1926 poem, I Too. I'd like to read the poem for you. I too, by Langston Hughes. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. Thank you, Mr. Langston Hughes. In this slide, in the far left and far right photos, Errol Hill is pictured acting in whiteface. On the far left, portraying Laertes in William Shakespeare's Hamlet, and on the far right, portraying Philip Chillum, a columnist for the Daily Gazette, an English playwright, J.B. Priestley's Music at Night. Errol was requ required to act in whiteface while studying at Loy London's Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, among other locations. The white audience and white culture of the time couldn't envision a man of color playing any Shakespearean role other than Othello or any role written by a white playwright about white culture for a white audience. My father mentioned that he never saw an actor of color on the London stage while studying there. The focus here was on white people's stories, physical settings, dress, etc. The 
Very early on, Errol Hill believed a change was needed. He is credited with sparking the modern era in theater in the Caribbean. As early as the mid-1940s, he founded the West Indian acting company, the Whitehall Players. As noted in the Caribbean writer, quote, when the urgency for plays with West Indian themes and language became apparent, Hill not only wrote his own, but also advanced Caribbean drama with notable innovations. He utilized the vernacular, a radical and controversial, con controversial departure for the time, and incorporated aspects of Trinidadian and Caribbean culture. I'd like to make reference here to our first panel and um, Silver Moon, uh, La Rose's presentation about the importance of language. His plays, Ping Pong, shown on the left, featured steel band players and another play, Wei Wei, focused on the Trinidadian Chinese numbers game. On the right is a performance of West Indian, St. Lucian playwright and Nobel laureate winner for literature, Derek Walcott's play, The Sea at Dauphin which focuses on the challenging lives of fishermen in the Caribbean. My father mentored a young Derek Walcott, who became a good family friend. Here are two photos of Errol Hill highlighting his defiance of white cultural norms, which had been unwittingly adopted by the people of the Caribbean. Beards at the time were considered disreputable. All men who could afford them wore closed-toed shoes modeled after the English, as evidenced by the, stu the student to the left of Errol in the photo at right. It was too hot in the Caribbean to wear closed-toed shoes. It didn't make any sense. Errol brooked convention by wearing socks and sandals, which was considered inappropriate at the time. Errol Hill's historical research produced numerous groundbreaking and award-winning histories, such as Shakespeare and Sable, a history of black Shakespearean actors. In the November 1985 Dartmouth Alumni Magazine, my father tells the story of how this important history came to be. He begins with, quote, one day in 1971, I was sitting in my office minding my own business, that sounds just like my father, <laughs> when out of the blue came a telephone call from a Yale colleague I hadn't seen in years. He was organizing a Shakespeare festival at the Pratt Institute in New York and thought it would be a good idea to have a lecture on Shakespeare and the black actor. Did I know anyone who could do this? Well, I was pretty sure no one in my circle of friends or any scholar of my acquaintance was working on this topic, and I had the feeling somebody ought to be. There was surely a story to be told, and it was time someone got to work on it. Well, it's a great story, and to learn more, you'll have to find the Dartmouth Alumni Magazine article as my presentation time is running out. <laughs> Errol Hill recognized the importance of all playwrights and the genius of Shakespeare. He particularly wanted to elevate actors of the African diaspora who performed Shakespeare with little, if any, recognition. His lifelong study and deeply researched histories of the African American and Caribbean theater earned him worldwide acclaim and a reputation as the foremost historical scholar in these fields. Performed at Spelman College in 1970, another play written by Errol Hill, Dance Bongo, was written in free verse and included the Trinidadian ritual dance for the dead. This photo illustrates the connections of the African diaspora, in this case, from the Caribbean to the African American South, that were so important to my father. Valuing, all our, own, value, valuing our own culture, heritage, and history and uplifting our stories, traditions, dress, and how we perceive ourselves. In this slide, we return to the esteemed poet Langston Hughes, presenting an award check to my father 
while he was a graduate student at Yale School of Drama. The connections and collaborations of our BIPOC artists run deep. As noted on the slide, quote, the end of spring brought no respite from his, Langston Hughes's, busy schedule. In New Haven, Langston attended a Yale Little Theater Award ceremony at which the Trinidadian dramatist Errol, Errol Hill was honored. Noted in Arnold Ramprasad's biography, The Life of Langston Hughes, Volume 2, 1941 to 1967, I Dream a World. In this closing slide, we see all the splendor and vibrancy of a Trinidadian carnival costume representing the bird of paradise. This picture for me is evocative of the, of the vibrancy of the African, African diaspora and this wonderful conference, uplifting in metaphorical song, the art, music, and writing in our BIPOC communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melina. Uh, you really helped to set the tone for reconstructing the canon. Uh, I want to call on Denise right now. And Denise's title is on Asian American uh, Film and Media Matters. So do you want to learn more about the context behind recent Asian American-led Hollywood successes? Like everything, everywhere, all at once? Yes. Yes, are you out there? You want to hear that? Um, I'm so happy to be here um, and to be able to uh, engage this conversation with all of you. Um, I am also really so thrilled to sort of think about um, in this forum this idea of the canon um, and the ways in which bike park communities um, in many ways recreate the canon. Um, and one of the ways in which I like, I'm trying to think about it is to think about the ways in which um, I think about the canon in relationship to Hollywood um, and to films like Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, um, as mentioned. Um, uh, I teach Asia, uh, here at Northeastern um, Asian American Film and Media. Um, and for many years, I would ask my students, um, can you name an Asian American film um, and for many, many years, um, I would usually have maybe one or two people raise their hand, um, and usually they would then respond with a film that was either from Hong Kong or, or uh, Taiwan, um, but, um, but, not, but, but not really an Asian American film. So, um, this year, of course, um, teaching it here at Northeastern, I think every single one of my students raised their hands and sort of responded with a film. There was many films to sort of, to sort of answer that question with. Um, and so it feels like we're very much um, at a certain kind of moment um, in thinking about Asian American film and media uh, production. Um, but part of um, what I wanted to sort of think about with my students and, and, and think about with all of you today is, is how, how we sort of got here um, and what is the sort of history um, of this uh, to that, what has sort of led us to this point. Um, so, um, so one of the things that um, you know, I would sort of point out is that um, Asian images, um, people, places, have always been a part of the cinema um, from the very advent of the cinema. Um, the earliest Edison films, um, the uh, biograph films, um, Asian representations have always been a part of that. Um, and we can sort of think about um, shorts like San Francisco Chinese Funeral, seen in Chinatown, of course, the Spanish-American War, the Filipino-American War, um, were um, taking place during this really sort of formative time um, in the American film industry, and that was also represented um, in early films. Um, 
really sort of important sort of early films in the silent era, like The Cheat and The Thief of Baghdad, actually featured um, bona fide Asian American actors. Um, some of the very first um, Hollywood stars were Sesu Hayakawa and Anna Mae Wong. And so their presence has always been a part of uh, the American um, cinema. Uh, some of you might be familiar a little bit with um, uh, Anna Mae Wong. Um, her sort of image um, is um, uh, perhaps um, more ubiquitous than, um, than you know, other figures. And of course she is newly minted on the, um, uh, by the US Treasury. Um, but she was a Chinese American actress born in Los Angeles in 1905. And she um, was uh, the first sort of Chinese American movie star. And she had an extraordinary career making some 54 films. Her career spanned the silent and the sound era. Um, and at this sort of moment, um, sort of formative moment, these sort of formative moments in Hollywood, right, um, she had such limited uh, roles, um, despite being in so many films, um, oftentimes she was sort of cast in these very sort of stereotypical roles, the dragon lady, the butterfly, amount of the, the sort of butterfly roles, right, these sort of, um, you know, sort of stereotypical roles that begin to sort of, you know, cast Asi representations of Asian women in very sort of limited frames. And of course, the Hollywood production code was a really um, uh, important um, uh, um, regulation that essentially ensure that she would never have a sort of starring role, right? Um, there could not be, you know, she could not be the star who would then have a relationship with the male star who was white, right? Um, so that really was something that curtailed her career um, and um, uh, led to, you know, uh, things like her not being cast in The Good Earth, right, which was um, really, should have been her star vehicle. Um, and so, you know, and of course Hollywood, um, as um, a, um, a sort of canon of sorts, right, um, has a sort of very long history, um, as we all know, uh, of racism. Right, so, um, and that has really um, shaped the possibilities for Asian uh, American actors to participate in Hollywood. Um, yellow face um, was a common practice both on the theater, on the stage, um, as well as um, on the screen. Um, and of course, this has its sort of um, uh, connection to long standing traditions um, of in 19th century minstrel blackface right, performances as well, so that there's a sort of connection there. Um, and, um, you know, and these come to sort of shape um, uh, the, the kinds of roles that become, that are possible. Um, these sorts of practices um, really impact, um, especially casting uh, throughout um, the sort of, uh, the history of the Hollywood film industry, um, really sort of curtailing the kinds of opportunities and roles that Asian actors have access to. Um, you know, uh, thinking about sort of our contemporary moment, right, we can think about sort of more, some contemporary manifestations of Hollywood racism, the ways in which accents, for instance, are sort of utilized to mark, demarcate um, characters um, in otherizing kinds of ways, the ways in which um, Asian actors, um, BIPOC actors, um, are often relegated to sort of secondary or minor roles. Um, that essentially complement or supplement white characters and their stories, right, as being the sort of central story, the central character. Um, and then, of course, uh, whitewashing um, in Hollywood, um, many sort of examples of this in which um, Asian stories, characters, settings um, are essentially replaced by white actors, white stories, and white characters and white settings, right? So um, those are sort of, um, a, uh, sort of very delimiting practices um, that come to constitute um, the sort of landscape of Hollywood and the mainstream uh, film and culture industries. And so um, it's sort of against this backdrop um, in many ways in which um, 
I think we can sort of think about the emergence of Asian American independent filmmaking in the 1960s and 1970s. And I think that this, um, in terms of thinking about the ways in which BIPOC um, uh, creators, um, producers are creating alternative stories um, or are speaking back to the canon, right? I think this is a really sort of important example. Um, um, the history of Asian American independent film, right, is really, you know, sort of rooted in a kind of alternative to this sort of mainstream Hollywood film industry. Um, and it's really sort of centered on supporting independent media, and it's really sort of rooted in the formation of independent Asian American media arts organizations, institutions that actually support independent filmmaking. Um, rather than being sort of oriented in the sort of commercial space sort of, uh, of, of Hollywood, it's actually really rooted in community-based media. Um, and from its sort of inception, right, um, filmmakers were thinking about how to create those alternatives, not just through stories and through the, um, in, the, the, in kinds of, the kinds of films that are being made, but also in terms of aesthetics, right, in terms of how do we create um, and um, how are we sort of creating our own sort of visual language to sort of tell like Asian American stories? And so many of the sort of early filmmakers um, are sort of um, uh, sort of engaged in a sort of anti-slick and anti-art kind of uh, set of practices. Um, uh, I was oops, sorry. Um, one, um, I think, important um, sort of um, institution that emerges from this moment is um, Ethno Communications, which was a film production program that was founded at UCLA in the late 1960s and 1970s. Um, and this is really, um, I think, you know, this was, you know, coming at, at, at a time following the Watts Rebellion. Um, and also this was uh, um, coming out of initiatives around affirmative action where UCLA was able to constitute right, a filmmaking program that centered and was for uh, students, uh, targeted for students who were Asian, Chicano, African American, and Native American. Um, and, and to sort of think about a filmmaking that was sort of influenced by um, uh, the sort of social uh, movements of, of, this, of this period. Um, Many of the filmmakers, um, the student filmmakers that would come out of this program um, would become, you know, the, um, the sort of pioneers of the field. Uh, they were very influenced by third cinema and the sort of liberation media movements of this time period, um, particularly Latin American filmmakers um, who were working in um, thinking about um, decolonization and, um, and, and filmmaking. Um, this is, of course, a very particular sort of moment where the Asian American movement is actually being born. Um, and uh, the, the, the category Asian American emerges at this moment um, as a kind of very specific political identity, um, sort of somewhat sometimes very different than how we sort of think about that category now, or at least sometimes sort of it's commonly sort of used, but at this moment in the 1960s, it really sort of emerges as a sort of political identity that is formed out of concurrent movements around the anti-war, uh, anti-Vietnam War movement, civil rights, and black power. And the filmmaking um, that sort of emerges at this moment is really influenced by all of these um, movements and these developments. Um, Eddie Wong was a student um, coming out of UCLA's ethno communications program, and this is his film Wong, Wong Sing Sang. I have just a little bit of a clip. I teach this in my class, um, but um, he produced this film. Um, he was very influenced um, by uh, after reading Malcolm X um, and um, understanding that sometimes um, the the colonized or the oppressed can see themselves through the eyes of the oppressor, right? So this was his sort of thinking, this is what, some of the things that he was thinking when he made Wong Sing Sang. And I'll just, uh, just a little, a short clip. Good to Wong. Hi, how are you? Good to find. Yeah. That's a good day for it, isn't it? Yeah. Right, I should say so. Yeah, yeah. 
I never knew much about my father as a child. As I grew older, I never really saw him behind his laundryman mask, behind the chink, that stereotypic, docile, quiet, courteous little Chinaman, deferring obediently to Buck Wee, the white man. And I never understood how a man could put up with the daily humiliations from the obnoxious white customers or the deadliness of the 12-hour grind. I loved him as son to father, child to God, as much as I held him in contempt as brother to brother, man to man. But I really didn't know him, or that he really didn't belong in a laundry in Hollywood, USA, and that when he works, he dreams in a world shaped by painting, poetry, scholarly essays, all the while transcending and resisting what we. Media institutions, I'll just sort of really briefly sort of wrap up. Um, another sort of, I, and you know, one of the things I really try to emphasize um, to my students is the importance of um, in, uh, or, um, institutions that su actually support um, independent uh, media production. Um, and so, and I think this is the true legacy of Asian American um, uh, independent filmmaking is the for, is the establishment of these institutions that continue to shape the media landscape and that have um, continued to support independent filmmaking. Visual communications um, was born out of this UCLA experiment in many ways, which only lasted ethno communications um, as it emerged in the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, after you know you know, frankly, sympathies for uh, these movements waned, um, uh, folded after a couple of years. Um, but one of the legacies that was born out of it is the formation of these independent media organizations. Um, Asian Cinevision as well, um, out of New York City, um, and NATA, um, the Center for Asian American Media, um, which continues to this day, um, and that continues to um, sort of build networks to support um, Asian American independent filmmaking um, uh, through PBS as well as through um, uh, independent uh, or, uh, Asian American um, uh, film festivals. Um, and then the final uh, organization that I want to sort of highlight is ADOC, which is a network for um, independent Asian American documentary filmmaking, um, really committed to ideas of decolonizing the documentary. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Denise. Um, just being able to, I mean, just sharing with us the historical as well as the contemporary uh, experiences of Asian Americans in film and moving that to um, independent filmmaking. I think what I really enjoyed about your presentation is really had to do with, as we're looking at BIPOC, uh, black, indigenous, and people of color, how much we cross paths. And I don't think we take time enough to be able to honor that, um, that we are in that struggle uh, together, and we do cross paths. So thank you so much for sharing that. 
Um, our next uh, panelist is going to be Allison Rawlins, and her title is Poetry, Imagination, and Creative Expression. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm gonna be really brief in my remarks, so hopefully we can hear from the audience. I would love to be able to engage more and have time for that. There are just two things I wanted to touch on in thinking about our panel um, title in terms of in living color, reconstructing the canon. And the first is what it means to, I think, see a canon as a type of living archive in terms of the environment. Um, when I think about the Black Heritage Trail and I think about uh, some of my work as an academic librarian in thinking about the natural landscape as a type of archive and in thinking about both formal and informal ways of archiving and curating information and knowledge systems. So I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri and I found out only after um, attending graduate school in Rhode Island that my paternal grandmother had actually been born to a whaler in Providence and he passed away when she was two years old due to alcoholism and I uncovered or began to discover a very rich history connected to Cape Verdean communities, connected to communities in Brockton, Massachusetts that I had no idea about. I thought I was just a Midwesterner <laughs> from the state of Missouri with folks in Illinois um, and so I wanted to read two poems for you all from my first collection of poetry, Library of Small Catastrophes. And the first of those is discussing um, pack horse librarians. So these were librarians that would go into rural communities in Kentucky to deliver resources as uh, one of the projects of the New Deal in response to the Great Depression. And I'm thinking about a legacy such as uh, the Black Heritage Trail in New Hampshire in terms of what forms of uh, information creatively or otherwise were being shared in rural underserved communities that are not necessarily attached to particular institutions or brick and mortar establishments. So this poem is called Portrait of a Pack Horse Librarian. The girl hears the snap and crunch of hooves like the sound of rabbit bones broken in the woods. She stands in the doorway barefoot. The library lady's horse appears to be smoking a pipe. Clouds of frost puff from its wide nostrils. The girl's mother greets the librarian, sees the rain has soaked through the librarian's shoes, the way her husband's tongue has stewed all night in corn liquor. Hunger thaws in the girl's belly. The librarian combs the growl's hair with a song. The girl's chipped front tooth gleams dull against the backdrop of the closing door's shadow. There are countless stars in the pitch black sky, yet the girl still has so few words. Now she sits on the floor, cradles a book like a toy boat in her lap, Determined, the librarian rides farther down the creek. She's learned a girl is carved from the words she does not know. So lastly, I also wanted to touch on the fact that this particular year, 2023, marks the 250th year anniversary of Phyllis Wheatley's publication, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. So we have a seven or eight year old girl um, captured on the coast of West Africa, brought to the slave ports in Boston, purchased by the Wheatley family, uh, suffers from asthma and other things rendering her unable to engage in more rigorous labor. She's educated in that household and taught to read and write and eventually develops this collection of poems. And so I was really struck in thinking again also about the canon, what it means for myself to be publishing, writing, teaching poetry in the wake of Miss Wheatley's legacy. Like what does that look like and really mean, especially in the New England region? Um, next month at Jackson State University will be also the 50th anniversary celebration of the Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival where um, ancestors like Audre Lorde, June Jordan, gathered, came together to um, celebrate and to think about the legacy of Wheatley as well. So I wanted to read um, one other poem that's thinking about reconstructing canon or reformulating canon in that tradition. And I wanted to also acknowledge um, 
the landmark text by Thomas Jefferson, Notes of the State of Virginia, in which he argues in response to Wheatley's collection, um, he has this phrase, amongst the blacks is misery enough, God knows, but no poetry. So this notion that suffering, that pain can be um, emotional sentiment found in black communities, but there isn't the capacity for poetry, art, imagination. And so I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, there's a scholar, Dr. Tara Bynum at the University of Iowa, who has a new book called Reading Pleasures, who is looking to discover conversations of joy and pleasure in black communication, in black um, scholarship, in black creativity, outside of the bounds of suffering. Um, so thank you. I know it's been a long day of listening, <laughs> active listening and being present in this beautiful space. So I'll close with this poem and then we'll hear from our last panelist. This poem is called, Why is We Americans? We as gator teeth hanging from the rear view mirror, as sickle cells suckle at big mama's teats. We as dragonfly choppers hovering above Walden Pond. We as spinal cords shedding like the skin of a cotton mouth. We as Psalm 23 and the pastor's chattering chicklets. We is a good problem to have. We as throats constricting and the grape juice of Jesus. We as roach and mingus in birdland. We as body electric, eyes watering with moonshine, glossy lips sticky with lard. We as half brothers in headlock, arm wrestling in the dirt. We as Vaseline rubbed into knocked knees and cracked elbows. We as ham hocks making love to kidney beans. We as Orpheus, liar in hand asking, do we have a problem? We as the backstory of myth. We as sitting horse and crazy bull. We as brown paper bags, gurgled belches. We as hooded ghosts and holy shadows roaming Mississippi, goddamned. We as downbeats and syncopation's cousin. We as mouths washed out with the blood of the lamb. We as witch hazel coated backs sucking on peppermint wrappers. We as the spiked antenna of a triangle faced praying mantis. We as barefoot tongue tied hogs with slit throats and twitching bellies. We as sun tea and brood bitches. We as the crying pussies that stand down when told to man up. We as Radio Rahim and Zoot Suit Malcolm. We as spit slick low cuts and fades. We as scrappy black mass coons and turkey necked bullfrogs. We as the pits of arms at stake, the clouds frothing at the mouth. We as swimmers, naked, private parts, Whitman allegedly fondled beneath the water. We as late lurkers and castrated tree limbs on the Sunday before last. We as red veined pupils and piss stained knickers slack jawed and slumped in the bathroom doorway. We is whiplash and backhanded ways of settling grief. We as clubbing woolly mammoths upside the head, jamming fingers in Darwin's white beard. We as coming round yonder, pigeon toed and bow legged, laughing our heads off. We as lassoed cowboys swinging in the sweet summer breeze. Thank you. Is she, is she not carrying on the legacy of Phyllis Wheatley and all those who've come after her? Uh, okay, that is reconstructing the canon for sure. <laughs> um, last but not least is Omarthan Clark. And his title is uh, Kako, you might have to pronounce this for me, but I'm going to try my best. Cacophonious. And it means involving or producing a harsh, discordant mixture of sounds. Is that correct, Lamarckin? Okay. And so, but it's finding inspiration behind and beyond the Western canon. In our discussion in planning, we talked about, you know, the substitution. We were talking Western canon, and then we said, White canon, perhaps? I don't know. Could you come, up, come on up and explain that to us? <laughs> okay. Let's see. Let's see. One, 
presentation. There. Oh, here we are. We're already here. I'm going to set my timer, Karen, so that I, I can be. Time too. <laughs> <laughs> so I can know how to. Oh, I need to use this. All right, cacophonous. Welcome. Um, good, good evening, everyone. I'm Omarthan Clark, and uh, welcome to my talk titled Cacophonous Finding Inspiration Behind and Beyond the Western Canon. It's essentially a quick story um, about how navigating, you know, PWIs, studying the arts, um, you, which privilege and center the Western canon, um, it can feel cumbersome. And I think if all of the scholars or academics um, or students, when we come together and talk about our work uh, or our research, um, we can feel like we're in harmony if we're referring to the same scholars, referring to similar theories and so forth. But sometimes I open my mouth in that classroom and I think I'm adding a sound that makes our song cacophonous. Um, and, I, and I would add that it, it feels quite violent at times and perhaps traumatic. So I'll, I'll, I'll briefly share what I'll be discussing with you. I'll share a note from my sketch pad from when I was um, studying um, in 2016, a comment a loaded comment, uh, a mission, a model for transformation, uh, three stories of art creation, two questions, and a conclusion. And it will be on time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll read with you. Uh, I made it through a door, but still yet uninvited. They looked, listened, and thought, but not for a moment saw or heard me. From my words, they understood what they already knew and heard things said before I was ever there. Um, in this, I was referring, I, I, I was reflecting on a party held by one of my classmates and you know, other, everyone was there and, and I just felt like there was this wall between us. Folks would, were talking about their work, folks were talking about their experiences and just being themselves in this really great scholarly environment. And through my interactions, I found, wow, most of these folks are not even listening to the things coming out of my mouth. They had an expectation of what I should say and where I should be coming from and what I even should produce. I left that party that was meant to rejuvenate and you know, build morale exhausted. Um, so I didn't go to any more of those parties. <laughs> so that's just to describe what I experienced, though, not just at parties or social occasions, but in the classroom. I would always be that one when we're, let's say we're talking about um, creative placemaking, which is a nice word for gentrification. Um, I, I, would, I would raise, well, what about this vulnerable community? And it's like, well, we're not talking about that, you know? Um, but I want to talk about that because those people um, aren't just important because they are them, but they're important to me because we share a history. We share parts of our identities. And so here's my comment. I'll read with you again. The Western canon is essentially a collection of literature and cultural artifacts presented in educational spaces to promote or reinforce white hegemony and delusions of whiteness as synonymous with sophistication and power. Though profound when not contextualized as works inspired by and situated alongside historic African literature, scholarship, and continuous worldwide influence, it becomes a weapon of colonization. Take a moment, breathe that in. We can argue within ourselves about it. Um, but it just rings true for me. And, and of course, in an environment like this, which can be intellectually competitive um, or, or, or you know, hands-on, folks ask, well, under what authority do you 
make such a proposal. Um, yeah, there are scholars and so forth out there that refer to this and say it in their own way, but I don't need to refer to them. All we have to do is look around. All we have to do is listen to the experiences of students, scholars, and people of color um, who engage not only in the arts, but maybe are studying philosophy or literature, right? So when I'm experiencing this, in order to give in to the resilient spirit of my ancestors and myself, I have to come up with a mission. And so out of this was a commitment, um, not only to care for myself, but the people in my community that I have a responsibility to care for, um, protect my mind and, and that of those whom I engage with via my role as an artist, educator, and administrator, uh, and advocate in general, uh, and also discover and apply methodologies for the creation of new site in an equitable manner. Thankfully, I worked on that um, in, in, in my uh, master's work. So I, I worked on this model um, I called creative art making, and I my advisors, I love my advisors, they heard me when I said, well, you know, I want to refer to some scholars um, that remind me of myself, and, and we had a relationship with Edna Manley in Jamaica, and I went out there, and I did my research, and I, and I taught, and I said, all right, yeah, I'm about to find these scholars, and I'm going to quote and cite the heck out of them. And I, I asked around, I said, find me a, a Jamaican history book because I wanted to find that my model um, or this idea of creative art making um, was active in policy, but also in everyday culture in Jamaica. Um, and they brought me this book. It was a, a, a white male. <laughs> it was written by a white. I was like, oh, bother, man, come on. But I found folks that, that spoke to issues, maybe not a historical account of Jamaica's policy and nationhood, but I found stuff that I could use. And my three stories of art creation will, I'll use them to emphasize the three main aspects of my model. Democratize power, democratize learning, and democratize worldview. This first image is titled Tomorrow Again. It was a mural that, um, I painted that was installed in outside of a community uh, in Columbus, Ohio called Wineland Park, being gentrified. And I titled it Tomorrow Again because it's not a new story, right? The school needs room for students and new professionals. And so this neighborhood's housing prices go up, the original homes get torn down, and the folks need to be able to tell their stories. So this painting was meant to remind folks of the beautiful children that live there, the homes that are being torn down, the, the institution that's serving the folks, and of course, uh, the Sankofa bird, which refers to uh, learning uh, about our past and um, preserving and nurturing the future as we move forward. Oh, that's democratized power. We worked with the members of that community to create a series of images that told their stories. Um, now, Democratized Worldview, this image is one of my paintings that um, was birthed from my trip, my, my trip slash research um, semester in Jamaica. Uh, it's titled The Matriarch. There's a whole story about the revivalists in Jamaica and Africanized Christianity what folks were talking about earlier was just all mixed up. It's so tied together and it's wonderful. But I'll say this, this woman walked past me and just by walking past me with the posture and power that she had, she became a personal hero. This was at a convention way up in the mountains um, of some revivalists. They keep their secrets and they do not share to outsiders and that included me. So I, I learned a major lesson, um, but I also was so inspired by the fact that they're preserving their stories, preserving their histories and symbolism as they build and move into the future um, as you know, peoples. Uh, so I wanna 
encourage folks to center your personal heroes. Um, that's one of the ways that we can resist the um, oppressive nature of the Western canon. Um, and lastly, this is an exhibit that's currently installed um, at UMass Amherst Augusta Savage Gallery. Uh, me and a group of black brothers, uh, artists, creatives, scholars, we worked for about six, seven months on this exhibit and we learned so much about ourselves. And I think the arts are a really wonderful place for people to do that, learn about ourselves individually, but ourselves collectively. And we just represent being black and being men uh, and just us. And it was just powerful, but it represents democratized learning. We challenged each other and we supported each other as we produce um, this exhibit. And I think anyone can participate in an occasion or an initiative like this. And I'll, I'll share my questions. Um, as we're talking about an experience, I started asking, well, what are the rates of attrition uh, or persistence to graduation for students of color studying art or arts administration or arts education at PWIs? Are we looking at that? Uh, also, what is the collective level of perceived belonging and inclusion for students um, of color in the arts programs at PWIs? If we're gonna talk about this, I think it, it's important to consider these questions. And I think you know, perhaps someone is looking at it or we could look at it together. And a conclusion, uh, loving our own art and discovering and celebrating other art created in our communities is a great way to disarm and dismantle the white supremacist qualities of the Western canon as a central educational tool. And I'll leave you with my favorite thing to say, creativity is a service to the artist first. Never stop thinking, never stop creating, create for you. Thank you. Well, Martin, that was wonderful. Um, what, what an amazing visual artist you are on top of all the other um, things about you. Um, thank you for those great questions. I think that Omarthan did a great job at bringing this panel and all of what we've been talking about today uh, to a fine conclusion. Uh, we will take some questions and I think I'll go up here, but I'm, I think I might ask you a question first. And so do we have any uh, questions uh, by way of the chat? And just give our panelists another round of applause, please. You know, I know it's the end of day. We run out of energy. We've had lunch and all of that. And I just want to thank you for stirring our souls and, and keeping us alive in the things that you had to, to share. Um, so we're gathering some questions. If not, I can certainly ask a few. <laughs> okay, here we are. Yes, hi, for Dr. Kaur, I have a question. Um, more recently, America's relationship with Asian Americans, right, seemed to be on a high note with the whole concept of model Asians, right, model minority, excuse me. But going back in historical context, the tension was always there going with the Chinese Americans coming over to work on the railroads and then being pitted against the uh, Irish Americans and then, you know, World War II with the treatment of the Japanese Americans. So my question to you is, what do you think changed or was that narrative of um, model minority American never really true? Because as we know with recent tensions, there was something underlying and brewing. Yeah, thank you. That's such a great question. I mean, I, I really sort of think about sort of these um, sort of ideas around Asians as a kind of like yellow peril or as a model minority, really in historical terms. Um, and so, you know, as you sort of point out in the sort of um, early 20th, um, you know, early, late 19th and early 20th century, um, this sort of discourse of like the yellow peril is very sort of central in the ways in which you know, Asians are often sort of, you know, sort of thought about, um, you know, sort of 
uh, sort of ideas of um, the Chinese railroad workers, for instance, as coolies was a, a sort of word that was sort of utilized, right? Um, the idea that they are coming to the United States um, in a kind of status of not semi, um, uh, you know, semi-freedom uh, in some sense, or kind of a compromised freedom, right? Um, and of course, this is sort of following, right, the end of the of the Civil War, right, um, where we, you know, uh, fought a war to end slavery, um, and so those sort of ideas are very much pervasive in the sort of 19th century, um, and you know, and I think. You know, it's really after the, you know, uh, after World War II um, and the Cold War um, that this sort of idea of the model minority really sort of emerges. Um, you know, so immigration policies change. We have more, we have Asians who are coming to the United States under um, things like the War Brides Act. Um, you start seeing the ways in which um, adoptees or um, people or Asians are um, uh, sort of um, becoming uh, a part of the sort of American family, so to speak. Um, and by the 1960s, right, this sort of idea of Asians as a kind of model minority is really sort of, you know, in some sense sort of instrumentalized, right, at a moment during the civil rights movements when African Americans are out in the streets, many people are out in the streets demanding civil rights, right? The idea of the model minority is a sort of, it becomes very disciplining, right? That here are Asians, they are, um, they are the, they are, right? If, we, if they are the model minority, who is not the model minority, right? Um, and um, how do you, right, um, how does that benefit in some sense, right? Become something that you become invested in, right? Because it is, um, and so, and, and, you know, you become invested in that by not doing, not being out in the streets, not, you know, causing trouble, things like that, right? And so I think that those, I think the Cold War and the context of civil rights were really sort of important moments in which this idea of the model minority myth really, really sort of takes root, right? Um, so. Thank you, Denise. Any other questions for our panelists? Any from the chat? Is there a hand up? I uh, just am feeling extremely grateful for the work that all of you are doing, as well as the panelists earlier. There's a lot of information that we need to have if we're ever going to truly be America. We have to claim and we have to name these histories it can be exhausting uh, if you are on the front line of telling these stories. You can get burnt out. Uh, you can grow tired. So I just want to voice that against the day that you do get tired and encouraging you and the rest of us who are not yet tired to keep on holding on and don't get tired because the stories need to be told. And I uh, invite all of you to uh, become aspirational patriots which is what I think of myself as, loving the dream of America, despising the reality too often, but refusing to give up on the struggle. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thank you for uh, helping me to uh, see some validation in my aspirational dreams for America. Thank you a lot. Mm, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I'd like to ask a question of each of you, if you don't mind. Uh, I'd like to start with Melina. Melina, how did, your, how did Professor Hill continue to uplift theater of the black diaspora while teaching at Dartmouth College? So really going local with that. Um, so thanks for that question. We are, we're prepared with the answer. <laughs> so um, my father was determined to highlight plays written by playwrights from the African diaspora and about the African diaspora. Uh, whether focusing on African, African-American, or Caribbean history and culture. This had never been done before at Dartmouth College. He also recruited students of color to act in his plays, 
and invited renowned actors of the African diaspora, such as Obie Award-winning stage actor and alumnus of the Negro Ensemble Company, Moses Gunn, and James Earl Jones, often described as one of the greatest actors in American history. Some of the plays he directed included Tijon and His Brothers by St. Lucian Playwright, and as you know, no Nobel Award winner, uh, Derek Walcott, Our Land by African-American playwright Theodore Ward, A Black Mass by Amiri Baraka, previously known as Leroy Jones. I won't state all of them, but I'm, it's important to hear some of these plays and playwrights. Mm -hmm. Edufa by Ghanaian playwright Efua Sutherland, Man Better Man, my father's uh, 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 award-winning play, uh, it was a groundbreaking musical written in rhymed calypso verse with traditional chants and original music. It centers a story around the Trinidad carnival traditions. Um, the musical was selected to represent Trinidad and Tobago at the 1965 Commonwealth Arts Festival in Great Britain. And other playwrights uh, who are not um, of the African diaspora, but from outside of uh, sort of uh, Western Europe and America, the orgy from Documents from Hell by Colombia's foremost playwright Enrique Buenaventura and The Blood Knot by white South African playwright and anti-apartheid activist Ethel Fugard. Thank you. Well, we stand on his shoulders and so it must feel really good to be sharing your father's legacy uh, here today. It's, it's wonderful to receive it, so thank you so much. Um, Allison. Uh, my question for you is, how can poetry, we, hit, we, we did a lot of poetry and you really came with some beautiful original um, work. How can poetry reconstruct the canon that we speak about? Um, sitting here in people's presentations, especially in this space of a church, a gathering place, a meeting house, a sanctuary, I, um, and while you were giving your presentation, I was reflecting also, I'm a PhD in English dropout. I did all of my coursework, was studying for comps, and then I was like, <laughs> this is not for me. When you speak of rest or rejuvenation or fatigue or being tired, um, and so I think in a lot of ways through things that would be legible as honestly failures, I've found poetry or the arts as a site of play and experimentation and trying to um, pursue curiosities, pursue acts of wonder in ways that felt um, that they centered a type of wellness or possibility. Um, and so for me, that's gone in and out of institutions, but I think poetry and having an arts practice, having a malleable relationship with language and with words has been centered to my own healing, my own ability to remain um, whole and a certain type of um, resilience. I think resiliency in the face of um, constant demands on what it means to survive and hopefully move towards a type of thriving in the lived experience that we are set in in this context. Um, so I just think having an arts practice, having some type of creative practice, perhaps alongside professional, institutional, academic, um, titles is really, really important to me. Yes. And so I think um, poetry is one of those avenues for me, but I, I really try to speak to the renegade or the people that are kind of trying to piecemeal different knowledge systems or ways of production and being in the world that are pushing against or subverting or complicating um, the current ones that we know, so. Yes, thank you so much, Allison. Uh, Omarthen, when you create and share your art, is there an intention for a specific outcome of impact on those who engage it? Yes, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. New site. Uh, the process of creation for me is transformational. It's how I have a conversation with myself about whatever it is. Um, is my, you know, subject. And when folks engage my work, sometimes I'll offer text with it, other times not. But I hope that they see something or consider something that they haven't considered before. And best case scenario, 
they will seek further knowledge of something that they did not intend to seek knowledge of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nicely put. So Denise, I know you, uh, you answered one, but I wanted to kind of uh, end with you on this question. And, and I know you kind of mentioned some of that in your presentation, but what kinds of approaches did Asian American independent filmmakers utilize? Again, as it pertains to as with reconstructing the canon. Right. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, for you know, in the sort of sixties and seventies, you know, filmmakers really um, sort of um, rejected um, sort of um, conventional practices of commercial filmmaking, mm-hmm. and so I mean, even you can sort of see in like Eddie Wong's. Um, sort of film, it's very, um, it's grainy, it's, it's rough, right? And, and so the sort of rejection of a kind of seamless sort of slick aesthetic that is very much Hollywood, mm-hmm. right? And so I think in doing that, they're trying to kind of, they were trying to sort of think about another kind of mode of representation, right? How can we tell these stories about, right, in this instance, his father, right, and the sort of incredibly difficult and um, repetitive and degrading work of being um, operating a laundry, right? So you mm-hmm. sort of see this sort of repetition of the white customer over and over again, and it's just on repeat over and over again. So through you know, stylistically, also through things like repetition in this instance, or other kinds of ways of trying to kind of represent, um, right, the labor that is being performed, the kind of experiences that, um, and to really sort of be able to tell that story of his Mm -hmm. father, right, and Mm -hmm. that he had always, you know, was always so ashamed of it, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't until sort of reading like Malcolm X that he realized that like, Oh, that's because, you know, I have been taught to see my father through the lens of the oppressor, yes. right? Yes. And so how then do you tell, how can I tell the story of my father um, and his, his sort of life and his work, right, through, um, um, through, to sort of acknowledge that that is how I have viewed it but to tell another story, right, Mm -hmm. so. Wonderful. Uh, Again, I'd like to thank our panel on In Living Color, Reconstructing Canon. I hope that you got a lot out of uh, this panel as well as all the other presenters today. I am, we're concluding for today and we're gonna clear the hall as I've been told so that we can get ready for our 6 p.m. dinner. And if there are any other announcements, uh, please let me know or take my spot (laughs) to make those announcements. Anyway, you've been a wonderful, wonderful audience and um, it's just been incredible. I, I, I hope that the next time we do this, that the, this auditorium or wherever we are will be standing room only because what's going on here today with Um, the conference is something that all should hear and experience and pass on to other if we're really going to uh, make change in the world. So peace to you.